Okay, real quick. So I actually wrote this original script in March 2021. See, I have receipts. And I said things like, we're being thrust back into the 1950s. If history follows suit, we're about to see LGBT plus violence and a ton of anti-trans legislation. It's going to spread like wildfire across the country. You know, mark my words. And at the time, I kept feeling worried that I was being hyperbolic or overdramatic. But holy shit. It obviously took me a second to make this video and homophobia has exploded so much that I actually think I sound a bit behind and understaty with some of the events that I discuss. So that's vindicating but terrible. My inner monologue is never allowed to call myself overdramatic again. Anyway, I still think this video is important and interesting and I hope you enjoy it. Oh, also, I'm like totally pregnant in it throughout the entire thing, which I feel like just adds this extra layer of irony or something. Yeah. Darkness, my old friend I've come to talk with you again Because a vision softly creeping Left its seeds while I was sleeping And the vision that was planted in my brain Still remains Within the sound of silence In restless dreams I walked alone Narrow streets of cobblestone Neat the halo of a street lamp I turned my collar to the cold and damp when my eyes were stabbed by a flash of a neon light that split the night and touched the sound of silence. Eh, a little melodramatic, I know. But like, I was a theater kid, so... Plus, I really like that song. I think it captures well how silenced many trans folks feel living in a society that regularly relays so much misinformation about them. After I went viral for the first time, I was properly overwhelmed by the amount of commentary that my video inspired. Newspapers, TV networks, books, organizations, and millions of individual YouTube commenters all wanted to, like, share their take on my identity. But I feel like Ash at least understands that navigating through these hot button topics is going to get you some attention right now. It's going to get you some traffic. Jumping onto these new labels and always going with the hottest thing and I have to question the sincerity. I don't really believe you. I'm sorry, I just don't. You're a girl. You're attracted to girls, so you're a lesbian and that's it. This is simple sex ed, people. And Ash, I'm sorry, your book is pure propaganda. It has a clear agenda behind it. Facing more skepticism, more ridicule, and more lies than ever before, I felt paralyzed and voiceless. The claims that bothered me most asserted that I was somehow a danger to people, particularly to children and other vulnerable populations. These folks contended that me, just being me and living my life publicly, acted to romanticize transness and consequently corrupt young cis people, especially girls, into becoming trans. Some media sources even went so far as to say that indoctrination was my content's ulterior motive. That I was knowingly preying on youth, attempting to recruit them into my trans following for my own social and capital advancement. <laughs> Is it just me, or does that level of conspiracy feel a bit like fan behavior? 
If you want my attention that bad, you can just tweet me. In this video, we are of course going to challenge the idea that trans people are dubious predators or indoctrinators. Before we do that though, I'd like to process my personal journey with you a bit more. And I need to thank some people who have indirectly helped me along the way. I don't even think some of these people know they helped, but they did. They're pretty helpful. You see, I was lucky. It took me a while, but amongst all the noise, misrepresentation, and falsehoods that conservative media was peddling about me and folks like me, I discovered some brave trans individuals and allies who pushed back. These creators neatly laid out a plethora of studies, history, and evidence, which clearly debunk the myths that LGBT plus folks are converting anyone. These creators plainly display that not only is sexual and gender education for children not harmful, but in fact, it can and has saved lives. Listening to these voices felt empowering, and it reminded me that, unfortunately, the squeakiest wheel usually gets the grease. What I mean by that is, sadly, measured responses which challenge transphobia with facts and figures aren't nearly as attention-grabbing as sensationalized media hit pieces that vilify trans folks. I mean, just think about it. What's gonna get more people talking? Ash Hardell, trans child groomer. Blech. Or this, a bunch of trans-affirming, peer-reviewed academic articles. But just because the former receives more press or buzz than the latter doesn't reflect anything about the merits, validity, or credibility of the actual content. So I'd like to try and balance the scales a bit by sending some love in the direction of a few smaller and medium channels who are really putting in the work and getting things right. My personal growth and this video would not be possible without them. So without further ado... And in the naked light I saw People, maybe more People talking without speaking People hearing without listening People writing songs That voices never share And no one dare disturb the sound of silence Fool said I you do not know Silence like a cancer grows Hear my words that I might teach you Take my arms that I might reach you But my words like silence And echoed in the wells of silence. Yay, welcome back! You made it to part two! I am happy you're here. If you haven't watched part one, hit pause because it sets up this whole series. It explains why I left YouTube and also explores the effects of radicalization and anonymity online. If you haven't seen it, then this video might not make a lot of sense. If you have seen it, great, let's dive right in. Theme three, scale. Do you like my shirt? In 2018, I published a video where I had a conversation with my mom over the phone about my gender and my desire to have top surgery. It was honestly a really sweet video. Hi. Well. It's something that I've wanted to talk to you about for a while. Um, so I guess it kind of comes in two parts. We'll start with the first one. The way that a, a lot of people and the way that I see gender is that it exists, you know, like on a spectrum. And I don't exist, I don't like exist all the way on one end of the spectrum. A word that you could use to like describe that and a word that I've been using to describe that is the word trans. So the, the second thing and probably the thing I'm just like a little bit more nervous to tell you is that, um, Oh, you got it. Yeah, you know. <laughs> yeah, but I think I want to go like all the way. Aww. 
And while the response was predominantly positive, it amassed over 13 million views. That was way bigger than any other video I had posted in my seven years on the platform thus far. Now, as I explained in our earlier discussion about the radicalizing effect of YouTube's algorithm, I was already on the radar of some pretty intense groups. TERFs, anti-SJWs, etc. So don't get me wrong, I was no stranger to hate by this point. But virality certainly exacerbated that. It exposed me to a drastically broader audience. I actually did some math. Don't trust it though, I'm gay. And 13 million views is roughly 3200% higher than what my videos were averaging at the time. After sharing that phone call with my mom, my audience would almost double in a year. As a result, the number of transphobic eyes and comments on my content skyrocketed. I was no longer insulated inside that safe community that I had spent seven years cultivating. Beyond attention from YouTube creators and commenters, I also faced coverage from traditional media. Most notably, this includes a feature in the Daily Mail and Christian Broadcasting Network, or CBN. There's never been a civilization ever in history that has embraced homosexuality. Same-sex guys kissing, you like that. Well, that makes me want to throw up. You know I what mean, they do in uh, San Francisco, some of the gay community, they, they want to get people, so if they've got the stuff, they'll have a ring, you shake hands, and the ring's got a little thing where you cut your finger. Really? In appreciation for your support, Pat Robertson would like you to have his new Turala cassette series, the Daily Mail splashed its false defamatory headline in giant text, which took up over 50% of the page's real estate, right by a photo of my face nearly just as large. It read, I've seen girls who've changed gender groom younger ones to do the same. And in nearly every case, they are autistic. The article tells the story of a teacher concerned about the increasing number of teenagers identifying as trans in school. There is a pretty thick layer of ableism, as the teacher explains her belief that it's unlikely that an autistic teen could truly understand something as complex as what it means to be trans. Instead, the teacher theorizes that young people on the spectrum are easily influenced and latch onto ideas that distract them from the problems caused by autism. Why have these teenagers chosen transness as their coping mechanism of choice? According to this article, older students and YouTube stars model and prompt this. They make transness look cool, interesting, and they even seem happy. How dare they? The column positions the teacher as a savior, speaking up just in the nick of time, describing her as concerned, devoted, and a whistleblower. The children, on the other hand, are victims in need of saving. They get words like vulnerable, exploited, brainwashed, and tricked. The villains of the story are YouTubers and older students who are convincing, persuasive, to blame, and groomers. And what weapon do these villains use? Trans identity and transition which are characterized as mutilation, harmful, scandalous, a tragedy, a nightmare, an agenda, so on. You'll notice that the piece never directly accuses YouTubers or older students of inappropriate sexual behavior, but the pedophilic overtone and language used is so evocative of sexual predation that you can't help but like feel your skin crawl while reading. By the time you get to my mention, you are primed to see me as icky, sneaky, untrustworthy, and a deviant offender, even though I can't seem to find my crime. Not explicitly, anyway. Later, we'll spend some more time unpacking the article's specific excerpt on me. Moving on from the Daily Mail, let's now talk about Christian Broadcasting Network. <laughs> This is CBN News Update, sponsored by Hidden Valley Ranch Salad Dressing. Around the time I went viral, CBN aired a segment criticizing a Canadian school curriculum called SOGI123. According to its website, SOGI123 helps educators make schools safe and inclusive for students of all sexual orientations and gender identities. Some of the resources and recommendations that SOGI sets up for schools include safety and harassment policies, guides for establishing GSAs, encouraging classrooms to display safe space stickers and to have LGBT plus resources on hand, and getting classrooms to to think about moving beyond binary gender language, i.e. instead of saying boys and girls, try everyone, class, students. I mean, that doesn't sound so bad to me. 
It actually sounds kind of awesome. Am I wrong? CBN would seem to think so. They don't mention any of that, and instead they characterize Soji as a radical sex ed curriculum being pushed in public schools by the LGBT community has parents afraid their children will become confused and even brainwashed. A curriculum that teaches public school students across Canada to celebrate the homosexual lifestyle. Carrie Simpson of Culture Guard calls the curriculum nothing short of child abuse. She sees Soji's real goal as altering our culture from a heteronormative society into one where anything goes, no boundaries, no values, no morals. Um, it's a hedonistic uh, cult. This is very scary stuff. Pastor Kevin believes Canadian Christians are in a Second Chronicles 20 moment. He says Satan is going after their most vulnerable, the children. And the church is beginning to prepare for what it takes to fight for our kids. And CBN took special issue with the trans-related education reporting. Lessons include books about transgender children, such as 10,000 dresses. Some kids are reacting very emotionally and saying, you know, and they're in fear. Will I be you know, will I suddenly struggle with feeling like a different gender inside of my body? All those beautiful qualities that make young girls beautiful girls and women are being basically vilified. The things that make our boys boys are being, you know, taken from them. All this and much more on the next 700 Club. So where do I come into this? Well, people kept sending me this video because in CBN's segment, my book seems to be the main visual representation for Soji's tools of indoctrination. Its cover and the name I was using at the time are clearly displayed in B-roll, and an image of my book is the default background, like the focal piece that sits behind the anchors as they report. If we take a closer look, you can see that everything in the frame is sepia tone, except my book, which is propped up and has the text radical agenda over it. Viewers of this program got to stare at the ABCs of LGBT plus while listening to things like... And George, this battle is unfortunately far from over, but some Christian leaders say it could be the issue mm -hmm. that wakes up a sleeping church in Canada. How, well, what, what's been the reaction to the story? Well, it, the story just came out yesterday on the 700 Club, and we have been flooded with comments on mm -hmm. social media. On face, It's on our Facebook and Twitter. Most people, I would say 98% of the comments are people that are against this curriculum. Sure. And of course, that's our audience, and they didn't know about it, mm -hmm. and they're outraged. I mean, the comments that are coming in, they can't even believe it's it's happening. And the fact that they want to take away parents' rights, that's and the then key. also go after children. Exactly. I mean, Satan doesn't play fair. He's going after the most vulnerable, and if he can get the government to say, parents, you're behaving badly, we're yeah. going to take your kids, kids away. Right. then, wow. I mean, God help us. The 700 Club is more than a television show. It's a helping hand reaching out to the family in so many ways. Satan doesn't play by the rules, y'all. Watch out. She has a point. I am a part of the Alphabet Mafia, after all. And like Wendy said, this program had a wide reach. It aired on the 700 Club, but got nearly 1 million views on CBN's Facebook page. Breitbart boosted the story because... Why wouldn't they? And it was even translated into Spanish and received over 400,000 views on Latin Christian news. Wow. I love that I got to be misrepresented and associated with hateful propaganda all around the world. Now you may have seen an older video on my channel where my spouse and I try to brush this whole thing off. And while we were laughing a lot on the outside, on the inside, I had some feels. But before we dive into those feelings, there is one more piece of media we need to address. Two years after the Daily Mail and CBN, Abigail Schreier published her book. While this did not take place in the direct aftermath of my virality, I wanted to discuss irreversible damage in this video because it represents the most widely distributed mainstream media scrutiny that I received. It also echoes many of the same dangerous predator and indoctrination sentiments that we heard from the Daily Mail and CBN. In Irreversible Damage, Schreier shares her concern about LGBT plus visibility and the formal sexual and gender education that some children children receive nowadays. She even has a whole section in her book called The Schools where she says things like, 
gender identity and sexual orientation education delivered with the tireless passion of priests is pretext for an ulterior aim. The prevention of bullying is used as an excuse for a thorough indoctrination in gender ideology. There is no reason to teach students, in the words of one of the most highly regarded school manuals, that the expression of transgender identity or any other form of gender expansive behavior is a healthy, appropriate, and typical aspect of human development. Let that sink in. There is no reason to teach children that trans people are healthy or appropriate. <sighs> Obviously, these ideas are incredibly problematic, and I'll break down why in just a bit. But right now, I want to talk about how I felt in the initial moments facing them. Encountering inflammatory accusations from mainstream media was totally novel and frightening for me. The reach, power, and authority behind a television network, a published book, and a newspaper, no matter how garbage I later learned that its reputation was, was intimidating. I felt helpless. I didn't have any input or control over these stories. You see, on YouTube, I can turn off comments. I don't often, but I can, if messages get excessively hateful or inaccurate. But I couldn't fly out to the UK, Canada, or Latin America and nicely ask these big institutions to stop lying about me. Plus, I have friends and family in these areas. How many of them saw these stories? Clearly I, a queer and trans person in their 20s at the time, am not the target demographic of CBN or the Daily Mail. Yet the only reason I discovered this media is because my audience kept sending it to me. So somehow this content made its way into the LGBT plus community. In those moments, I felt so embarrassed. I mean, just imagine. Hey Ash, how's it going? Uh, just wanted you to know that uh, they're calling you a, a child predator over where I live, so have a good one. How do you respond to that? Hey, oh, uh, thanks. Yeah, just hate when that happens. Am I right? <laughs> well, I know or I hope that these folks were appalled to see this. A little part of me always wondered if maybe they thought it was true. And that sucked. As for Schreier's book, it was promoted on The Ben Shapiro Show, The Candace Owens Show, The Rubin Report, Tucker Carlson Tonight, Jordan Peterson's podcast, PragerU, and The Joe Rogan Show. You know, only the most popular podcast in the United States. At least, it was at the time. I don't know anymore, I don't care. Which is also one of the reasons I don't feel bad about platforming this book. I mean, you really can't get much more publicity than an hour and 45 minute shout out from Joe Rogan. So I don't think my video talking about this is making that big of an impact. What's more, the book is on Amazon, available for in-store purchase at Barnes & Noble, and for eight or nine months, it was on the shelves at Target. Talk about feeling vulnerable and exposed. My literal trauma was just a 10 minute drive away for most people living in my country to just pick up and read about. A while ago, Target did end up eventually pulling the book, but despite my best efforts, I couldn't find a statement from them regarding why. When it was in stores, my heart sank whenever I passed the book section. I have pals and classmates who work at Target. My mom shops at Barnes & Noble. There are several people in my life who don't totally get the whole trans thing, but who try to understand it as best they can for me. I can imagine those people seeing this book in stores and picking it up to learn. Then I picture them reading the plethora of misinformation and finally getting to my name. The idea makes my stomach turn. What if this book colored the way my family, neighbors, professors, or colleagues saw me? What if it cost me relationships or opportunities? I also racked my brain with how so many established institutions could get away with spreading falsehoods. I mean, don't most stories go through rounds of editing? From pitch to proof to publish, I mean, multiple eyes had to sign off, right? Don't newspapers understand platform responsibility? Aren't Christians supposed to love thy neighbor? And Schreier, she studied at Yale, Columbia, and Oxford. Girl has some academic chops. I know at least one of those schools taught research methods and ethics in journalism. So then how did these claims make it that far out there? How did no one along the way say, hey, none of this makes sense and it's it's awfully hateful. Maybe we should double check this nonsense before we defame a crap ton of people. How did that not happen? And how did Irreversible Damage become one of The Economist's books of the year? How did these 250 pages of baseless content fool so many people? After a while, I started to think, well, 
Maybe they didn't fool anybody. Maybe these claims got through multiple rounds of checking, and maybe the authors are winning awards because there's something there. Maybe these people are not all wrong. Perhaps I'm the one who's missing something. Uneasy and overwhelmed, I found myself thinking more and more about the predation and indoctrination claims. Soon hundreds of intrusive memories from both my past and present haters began running like a Rolodex in my head. For instance, remember the lolcow folks from last video who thought I was so punchable? Well, they also said... Ash practically dragged her wife Gray into the cesspool of non-conforming genders. Yeah, she roped Gray into it. And recall those Avatar-hosted anti-SJW channels, also from last video? Well, some of them made videos like this. <laughs> it's indoctrination time, my pretties. So, this is why Jake Edwards came out as non-binary. Sorry, Jake. For the first time, I started to just barely wonder, could there be any truth to these claims? Am I just lonely? or really insecure about being boring? And so to cope, am I seeking... Attention. Attention! Attention, whore. Oh, for fuck's sake, her views were dropping. And in my quest for attention, fame, money, and power, have I hurt folks? Did I become... A world-class salesman. A transgender influencer coaching adolescents and pushing life-changing interventions on young girls. Just another internet egg hatcher with the blood of a lot of young people's mutilated and castrated bodies on her hands. A proselytizer, a true believer, a recruiter. Someone who intentionally reaches out to vulnerable, damaged, and impressionable young people just like any cult leader. You can only read so many comments like that before they start to slowly legitimize in your mind. Like, actually. Research shows that the more time marginalized groups are discriminated against, the more they will internalize that discrimination. People are programmed to pay more attention to negative events than positive ones, because we tend to learn more from negative experiences. Think, we realize pretty quickly not to touch a hot stove if we poke it once and get burnt. Bad stuff like that just sticks with us more. And I share this so I can say, I am not a snowflake for being affected by all of this. I'm human. And as I've stated a quadrillion times in this series, I am far from the only one who's experienced extensive internet hate. Sadly, dogpiling and digital hate mobs are common occurrences online. And a big enough number of voices, or the air of prestige given off by a book, newspaper, or television network, can add authority and the illusion of credibility to a message, no matter how flawed or untrue it is. Gotta start out each new shot with a sip of coffee. In the color-coordinated mug. I got glitter in my eye. Oh no. Oh no, I got glitter in my eye. Oh no! Okay. Speaking of dishonest messages, why don't we spend some time now deconstructing and debunking some of the ideas that these three stories perpetuated. Specifically, I'd like to challenge the notion that LGBT people are child predators or indoctrinators. In order to do this, though, we will need to take a trip through history. <laughs> You see, the queer predator trope and indoctrination rhetoric, these are both tales as old as time. Before focusing so heavily on transgender individuals, people used to target homosexuals and the greater LGBT plus community. Like, even more than they do now. Which is impressive, because the right has been going hard in 2022. Perhaps you've heard of the Save Our Children campaign. Formed in 1977 and headed by evangelical Christian Anita Bryant, SOC was the first ever organized opposition to gay rights in America. It was born as a response to Florida legislation. 
Florida, which banned employment discrimination and some other forms of discrimination based on sexual orientation. Bryant didn't like that local businesses could no longer fire the gays, and she said, The ordinance condones immorality and discriminates against my children's rights to grow up in a healthy, decent community. Oof, that sounds familiar, doesn't it? Bryant believed that an LGBT plus inclusive community could not be healthy nor decent, just like Schreier believes that a transgender inclusive school is not healthy nor appropriate. Bryant strongly worried that gay people were trying to recruit our children into homosexuality. In fact, she popularized the notion that homosexuals cannot reproduce, so they must recruit. And to freshen the ranks, they must recruit the youth of America. We talk about the danger of the homosexual becoming a role model to our children. And I'm not talking necessarily of child molestation in the physical. I'm talking about the psychological, which is even more detrimental. Official SOC campaign literature also read, There is a real danger that homosexual teachers, social workers, or counselors, simply by public acknowledgement of their lifestyle, can encourage sexual deviation in children. Huh, I feel like... We've heard that before, too. A radical sex ed curriculum being pushed in public schools by the LGBT community has parents afraid their children will become confused and even brainwashed. Save Our Children campaigned for a referendum to overturn the anti-discrimination laws, and they were successful, repealing gay rights in Dade County, Florida. The laws of God and the cultural values of man have been vindicated. The people of Dade County, the normal majority, have said enough, enough, enough. Glory, glory, hallelujah, his truth is mine. and anti-LGBT plus violence followed this outcome, including the death of Robert Hillsborough, who was stabbed 15 times while his killer and bystanders shouted the F-slur and phrases like, this one's for Anita. After their victory in Florida, Save Our Children's campaign expanded and repealed anti-discrimination ordinances in several cities around the country. We have uh, three national bills to contend with that would not only allow flaunting homosexuals to uh, be in the private religious schools, but the national bills put it into the public schools. So it's a nat national problem now. We will prevail in our fight to repeal similar laws throughout the nation, which attempt to legitimize a lifestyle that is both perverse and dangerous. Of course, Save Our Children is far from the only anti-gay blemish in the world's history. For our UK friends, there was the more recent Section 28, in effect between 1988 and 2003. This law banned the promotion of homosexuality and the promotion of the acceptability of homosexuality as a pretended family relationship in schools. I obviously don't want children taught that the gay and lesbian lifestyle is natural or normal. It is not, it never has been, and it never will be. I hesitate to use the word perversion, but let's face up to the truth of, of this situation. That's what it is. Children who need to be taught to respect traditional moral values are being taught that they have an inalienable right to be gay. And a conservative MP had this to say about the legislation. I do not agree with homosexuality. I think that uh, Clause 28 will help outlaw it, and the rest will be done by AIDS. With the substantial number of, of homosexuals dying of AIDS, I think that's probably the best way. Best way. I think these quotes capture pretty well where those who worry about indoctrination are really coming from. If you think that being LGBT is a perversion that should either be outlawed or taken care of by AIDS, then your primary focus is not protecting children. 
It is eradicating queer and trans people. Now, if you're feeling like that AIDS comment was a pretty extreme, fringy, or dated perspective, well, I invite you to revisit some of the messaging we just heard from CBN in 2018. Aggressive homosexual agenda, hedonistic cult, child abuse, Second Chronicles 20 moment, preparing for what it takes to fight, battle. If these folks don't want to erase the LGBT plus community, then why are they demonizing it? And like legitimately speaking as if they are getting ready for war. Second Chronicles 20 is literally about God helping his followers smite an army. And it ends with, behold, there were dead bodies lying on the ground. None had escaped. Cute. And even more recently, as political tension around queer and trans issues rises in the United States, in this record-breaking year of anti-LGBT plus laws, we are starting to see increasingly radical messages, such as... What does God say is the answer, is the solution for the homosexual in 2022, here in the New Testament, here in the Book of Romans, that they are worthy of death? These people should be put to death! Every single homosexual in our country should be charged with the crime, the abomination of homosexuality that they have. They should be convicted in a lawful trial. They should be sentenced with death. They should be lined up against the wall and shot in the back of the head. That's, right. That's what God teaches. That's what the Bible says. You don't like it, you don't like God's work. For the good of society, and especially for the good of the poor people who have fallen prey to this confusion, Transgenderism must be eradicated from public life entirely. The whole preposterous ideology at every, at every level. level. To me, it feels pretty clear that putting an end to LGBT culture, identity, and frankly existence seems to be the greater goal for many folks. And those who fearmonger about indoctrination are using children as a means to accomplish that objective. In my view, they are the ones exploiting young people, using them as pawns in their broader political agenda. Take Tim James, for example. I'm Tim James. Why do our politicians make us give driver's license exams in 12 languages? This is Alabama. We speak English. If you want to live here, learn it. In his 2022 campaign for governor of Alabama, James didn't think twice before aggressively targeting a specific charter school designed to accept LGBT plus youth and non-consensually using images of real LGBT plus children in his hateful ad. When criticized for this by a student's mother, I think it's disgusting that a grown man running for governor for the entire state would choose to single out children and use them as pawns for his campaign. James verbalized no remorse and even doubled down. She should be either angry at the school or herself, but quit blaming us because she put the child in that position in the first place. Indicating that he had no intention to stop this type of campaigning anytime soon. When we show the images that are coming up that are on their Facebook page, Every mom and dad, every person in this state are going to blow an absolute gasket. If I had to guess, I'd say that Abigail Schreier would likely be an enthusiastic supporter of candidates like Tim James. In her 2020 book, Irreversible Damage, Schreier waxes nostalgically about when sex and gender education were not allowed in schools. She warns parents that times have changed, saying, You grew up differently. You didn't soak your retinas in the internet's transgender propaganda during a confusing time in your life. And you didn't attend today's public schools, many of which provide K through 12 indoctrination in gender ideology that is both so radical and so pervasive that it is hardly surprising so many kids want to take cover under an LGBTQ umbrella. The schools are not forcing adolescents to identify as transgender, but they are greasing the skids. Indoctrination, propaganda, agenda. I probably sound like a broken record, but we see emotive words like this weaponized over and over and over again throughout history. In Irreversible Damage, in fact, a simple control F search reveals that the word indoctrination appears six times. The word cult appears 10 times, coached 10 times, propaganda twice, and brainwashed twice. I don't think I need to convince anybody living in the States today that the rhetoric and worldviews of people like this do not exist in 
in vacuums. Abigail Schreier, Anita Bryant, Wendy Griffith, George Thomas, Greg Abbott, Tucker Carlson, Christy Noem, Kay Ivey, Marjorie Taylor Greene, Ron DeSantis. These folks is personal opinions about queer and trans people do not begin and end with them or their families, but rather they have legitimate political consequences, especially as of late. In 2022, over 300 anti-LGBT bills, with a huge chunk of them targeting trans people, were proposed. That is an unprecedented amount. And thanks to Anita Bryant 2.0, <coughs> I mean Ron DeSantis, and his Don't Say Gay bill, which prohibits the non-age-appropriate discussion of sexual orientation and gender in schools, it feels like Florida has been thrust back into 1977, forced to relive the Save Our Children era all over again. And if history's taught us anything, it's that the Don't Say Gay bill could have the same kind of rippling effect that SOC had in the US in 1977. Which means that we could expect the repeal of many more LGBT plus rights and the rise of anti-gay violence before things get better. When we see rhetoric like this in books, on screen, in educational policies, politics, and now in so much current legislation, we need to think of young queer and trans kids in schools as well as young people who have LGBT plus friends and family members. Ideas like this are easily internalized and wreak havoc on the mental health of queer and trans youth. These ideas are also absorbed by straight and cis peers, which can lead to increased harassment and violence in school environments. In 2010, the It Gets Better project was created when the nation witnessed the consequences of elevated LGBT plus harassment and America experienced what the media referred to as a suicide epidemic. Like all of you, I was shocked and saddened by the deaths of several young people who were bullied and taunted for being gay and who ultimately took their own lives. As a parent of two daughters, it breaks my heart. It's something that just shouldn't happen in this country. As a nation, we're founded on the belief that all of us are equal and each of us deserves the freedom to pursue our own version of happiness, to make the most of our talents, to speak our minds, most of all, to be true to ourselves. That's the freedom that enriches all of us. That's what America is all about. And every day, it gets better. And since conditions continue to be uniquely challenging and volatile for queer and trans students, sadly, suicidal ideation and attempts remain problems for youth today. In 2022, the Trevor Project's National Survey of LGBTQ Youth Mental Health found that 45% of LGBTQ youth and nearly half of transgender and non-binary youth seriously considered suicide in the past year. What's more, trans men and boys, so Schreier's target audience, were the highest demographic for attempted suicides at 22%. Clearly, this is a major problem, and LGBT plus youth need our help and support now more than ever. As Rowan Ellis eloquently puts it in her video on this topic, which you all should check out. Students need to know that things don't get better in some nebulous future, but rather that people are working to make their schools and homes safe and accepting places for them in the present. For trans youth specifically, this is why the APA and the National Association of School Psychologists encourage school and staff to support the decisions of children, adolescents, and families regarding a student's gender identity or expression. This recommendation is supported by research which found that transgender youth who are allowed to socially transition report levels of depression and anxiety similar to those of their cisgender peers. This might not sound like a big deal, but it was, in striking contrast to previous work with gender nonconforming children who had not socially transitioned, which found very high rates of depression and anxiety. Trans kids are not asking for much y'all. They just want to be as stressed and depressed as everyone else. Support from one's community and caretakers is incredibly important. As far as home life is concerned, research Researchers found trans youth who indicated their parents were strongly supportive of their gender identity and expression were significantly more likely at 72% to report being satisfied with their lives than those whose parents were not strongly supportive at 33%. That is a pretty significant discrepancy. Additionally, the study found that strong parental support of gender identity and expression decreased the likelihood of a suicide attempt in the past year by 93%. Wow. So as we can see, the scientific evidence shows that gender affirmation for young children increases their health and well-being. But sadly, it seems that many leaders out there aren't listening to the scientific consensus. As a result, our schools and politics appear to parallel the sentiments from almost 50 years ago. 
and LGBT youth continue to face the same blows over and over and over and over again. So many set changes in this one. Well, we've accomplished a lot so far. We've covered examples of how the queer predator and indoctrination tropes have existed throughout history, and we've seen the serious negative consequences of them. We've also discussed the positive outcomes of pro-LGBT plus education. Now it feels like the only question left is, why? Why do these harmful caricatures exist in the first place? What are the underlying myths and mindsets that feed them? The three most common beliefs that I've observed which perpetuate these tropes are 1. That LGBTness is somehow contagious or corrupting 2. That LGBTness is inherently sexual and 3. That LGBT identity is confusing. Let's investigate each of these. First, the misconception that being LGBT plus is contagious. That someone can catch it or convert simply by being exposed to queer and trans folks. This is an idea that is commonly pushed by transphobes. In fact, Schreier's opening chapter is literally titled The Contagion. But let's be real, the idea that simply acknowledging and accepting gayness will somehow convert individuals? It doesn't make sense, because it's incongruent with the way these people view and treat straight sexual orientation. I was born of heterosexual parents, I was taught by heterosexual teachers, in a fiercely heterosexual society with television ads and newspaper ads, fiercely heterosexual, a society that puts down homosexuality. And why am I homosexual if I'm affected by role models? I should have been a heterosexual. And no offense meant, but if teachers are going to affect you as role models, there'd be a lot of nuns running around the streets today. There's clearly a double standard operating when it comes to what identities are considered infectious. What's important to remember, though, is peddlers of these myths don't care about making sense. They care about instilling fear. This is apparent in the Daily Mail article. Their story on trans YouTubers and older trans students implies that any kind of modeling will almost certainly sway younger people, possibly in the thousands. According to the Daily Mail, if queer and transness is a contagion, then LGBT plus YouTubers are the super spreaders. And if being LGBT is not spontaneously caught from mere exposure, then it must be because an older, gayer, transer person corrupted a vulnerable, pure person. Let's now dissect the Daily Mail's specific excerpt on me. Transgender YouTube star Ash Hardell is idolized by hundreds of thousands of teenagers around the world. This opening line establishes my influence and power. Ash introduces one video about breast removal entitled I Got Top Surgery with the words Watch My Journey to Flat and Happy. This next sentence is just accurate. That's what happened. <laughs> But for some reason, it's a scandal? How dare trans people be happy, I guess. Commenting on the video, one young follower said, When I'm older, I will get top surgery, no matter what my parents say. And the final comment provides an example which is supposed to confirm that I am indeed influencing folks. The problem with this idea, though, is not once does the Daily Mail consider that this commenter could truly be trans and benefit from future surgery, because that's a possibility. Authors of content like this, however, are often operating under the fundamental belief that trans identity is neither valid nor real. So there is no one that is truly trans. Schreier demonstrates this belief when she awkwardly tries to flex her tolerance of LGB folks while still emphasizing her distrust of T folks, writing, It's worth noting how different being the parent of a trans adolescent is from being the parent of a gay adolescent. An adolescent who comes out as gay asks her parents to accept her for what she is. An adolescent who is transgender identified asks to be accepted for what she is not. So because no one truly or naturally is trans, I then am painted as some sort of snake charmer who has mesmerized kids into falsely believing that they are trans. But what I don't understand is how can you claim peer or social media influence over transition when cis and straight sex and gender concepts are coerced from birth? How do you control for or identify a person's 
true innate gender when one is assigned before someone even has a sense of self. There's that double standard again. Perhaps the article believes I'm influencing because I'm expressing happiness? in my video, so in a way I'm romanticizing the trans experience, making it seem super heckin' fun, just a bunch of sunshine and rainbows. However, that is only because the Daily Mail conveniently excludes essential context and other quotes where I discuss in detail all the hardships I've endured related to my transness. The video of my top surgery, which the article references, also includes clips of me crying, puking, healing, asking all kinds of questions, practicing thoughtful introspection, and deeply reflecting on my choice both before and after the procedure. Even my original pinned comment from years and years and years ago states, this vid has everything, the good, the bad, the ugly, and all the love that top surgery has given me. The Daily Mail can't include that though, because it would be inconsistent with the picture that they're trying to paint, which is that I am negligently advertising medical transition as a fun and easy miracle cure to all of life's problems. It's not, and I'm not doing that. And for the record, when the person who left this comment does become an adult, I think they absolutely should be able to get top surgery if they still want to, no matter what their parents think. Adults have the right to bodily autonomy, and studies show that for those who are properly evaluated and provided with the necessary information for informed consent, top surgery can be a valuable treatment. When we look at surgery, the regret rate for surgery, this is the best study ever done. This study was done over a 50 year time frame on 767 people who underwent gender affirming surgery. Of them, 2.2% regretted having it done. LASIK, like getting your eyes corrected, has a 5% regret rate. So these people literally had their genitals reconstructed and 2.2% of them were like, meh, I wouldn't do it again. So not only is surgery necessary and helpful for many trans folks, but less people regret it than LASIK. No one seems concerned about policing adults who get LASIK, though. Mega makes sense. All of this is to say that LGBT plus individuals being themselves and being happy does not work to infect or corrupt cis straight people. Moving on, the next belief is that there is something inherently or overly sexual about queer and trans people, and therefore we are inappropriate for kids. These claims are also full of contradictions. First of all, how can one claim that LGBT plus identity is sexual when straightness isn't sexualized? I think we've all heard the example of like, a little girl playing in the park with some neighbor kids when an adult teases, Susie, I see you're swinging with Gavin. You got a little boyfriend? That is seen as total innocence. No one jumps to assuming that there's any sort of coercion or manipulation into making Susie straight. But reverse it, make it girlfriend instead of boyfriend, and it would be seen as weird. And think about it, no one bats an eye when we see a straight couple slow dancing at prom and they share a quick kiss, but have it be two guys and it's proclaimed inappropriate or not suitable for the environment. It's clear that the tables turn when queerness is involved. So because being gay or trans is no more sexual than being cis or straight, the only way to make LGBT plus identity seem overly sexual is to actively sexualize us. This is accomplished a few ways. First, there is often a hyper-focus on the shapes, functions, and appearances of queer and trans bodies. Turning sideways, Elliot shows off her flattened physique, a bulldozed version of a woman's profile. They have no plans to obtain the male appendage that most people would consider a defining feature of manhood. Jet Taylor is, like his name, hot. Jet has the boy band looks of a young Justin Bieber, full lips, soft beard hair, big brown eyes, and nice, even features. Ew, ma'am, excuse you. These are real people that she's talking about. A lot of the videos that she's chosen are either of younger trans people or like videos we posted when we were younger. Um, so like the ones she's talking about me, I'm 17 and I got uncomfortable reading what she had to say because she's like making comments about my lips and stuff. It's just, it's just weird. <laughs> I don't know where you have to be in your life to be a grown ass woman writing a book to be published where you feel the need to talk about the way a 17 year old kid's 
lips look while also simultaneously calling him like a weird child predator or something I don't fucking it's it's beyond it's out of reality the frequent and graphic way that Schreier describes trans bodies is something and that something is uncomfortable <laughs> Additionally, when depictions or stories of LGBT plus people are told, often their sexuality is expressed in a profane, inappropriate, or hypersexual way. Their relationships and behaviors are linked not with healthy sexuality, but with perversion, deception, pedophilia, and danger. We have seen this kind of portrayal of AMAB trans people in popular media for a long time now. A myriad of culturally influential movies like Psycho, Dress to Kill, and Silence of the Lambs all feature transgender-coded characters as sexual predators, fetishists, and serial killers. <laughs> For a while, transmasculine folks seemed to be mostly free of this kind of sexualization and demonization. Rather, AFAB people were thought of by TERFs and others as lost women, victims of self-destruction and internalized misogyny who don't know what's good for them. This can be described as an infantilizing lack of sexuality. They've also never been sexually active. Many have never had a kiss with a boy or a girl. According to Sasha Ayer, a therapist whose practice is largely devoted to trans-identifying adolescents, many have never masturbated. Their bodies are a mystery to them. Their deepest desires underexplored and largely unknown. But lately, the language has been changing when it comes to AFAB trans people who have some sort of cultural presence or platform. Now, some of the more sexually predatory language is starting to be levied against these folks as well, although there appears to be a certain level of testing the waters and borders. This seems to be especially true with someone like Schreier, who knows it's a bit unsociable to outright say that trans people are sexually perverse and dangerous. In her book, she asserts no actual accusations of sexually predatory behavior towards AFAB trans creators. Because she can't. Because we aren't doing anything wrong. Because there is no link between trans identity and sexual predation. I mean, trans people can be predators, sure, but to the same degree and proportion as cis people. Currently, there is no empirical evidence to support the idea that the trans community preys on people, making spaces like bathrooms and prisons unsafe. In fact, studies show that the opposite is actually true. It is trans people who are significantly more likely to be targeted in these places. And I have tons of sources is linked in the description on this if you want to learn more. So because trans people are not inherently predatory, like the Daily Mail, the next best thing that Schreier can do is prime her audience and conjure ideas about trans predation in their heads. She uses words like seduce in reference to behaviors and outcomes that are divorced of sexual predation. After describing the results of my personal top surgery, which she writes looks something like the body of an eight-year-old boy. Thanks. <laughs> Schreier starts discussing the idea of non-binary medical transition in general, and she compares the idea to Michael Jackson's perfect nose, something that does not or has not ever existed. Later in her book, she directly calls Michael Jackson a pervert. In the same chapter that covered my top surgery, Schreier draws a parallel between trans YouTubers and the artful dodger, the swaggering, street smart pickpocket of Oliver Twist. Dodgers, no model citizen. For young people, she describes the experience of discovering online trans gurus as equal parts thrilling and disconcerting to curious tweens, like the pornography they're curious about but not quite ready to see. Seduce, pornography, pervert, Michael Jackson, pickpocket. In using that kind of language and making those kinds of associations, there is a tonally false equivalency made. She isn't calling us groomers pedophiles or con artists directly, but she is linking us to those concepts. To use some of Schreier's own words, she isn't forcing her readers to think that trans people are predators, but she's greasing the skids. She even ends the influencer chapter with another Oliver Twist quote, this time a song. Consider yourself at home. 
consider yourself one of the family we've taken to you so strong it's clear we're going to get along bup, 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 bup. <laughs> the reader exits this section of the book with a catchy tune in their head and lyrics that reinforce the connection between trans youtubers and deceptive swindlers. And finally, number three, there's the belief that queer and trans identity is just too confusing for kiddos for some reason. And I am simply going to let Rowan Ellis debunk this one because honestly, she explains it perfectly. There's this idea because we live in a heteronormative society in which straight is seen as the default, that explaining LGBT things to children will be too confusing for them, too outside the norm. And I think that's just a reasoning for why we need this education in the first place. If something which is so basic as being gay is confusing and needs to be explained to children, this is something that should be just as acknowledged as straight couples are from the earliest years, surely. We have children who have LGBT family and friends and they're not confused. The confusion will come from the outside world telling them that their parents are wrong or that they shouldn't have them. It doesn't come from the parents themselves. More education is only going to stop confusion, it isn't going to start it. If we have these lessons which are age appropriate then it shouldn't be confusing at all. Any more than trying to learn about complex equations is confusing. In fact it is a lot easier to work out and comprehend than equations. Oh my gosh, she is so smart. Also, a lot of the more historical media clips that I used in this video came from Rowan's research, so I highly recommend you perusing her channel and subscribing. I'll put a bunch of my favorite vids of hers in the description. Anyway, while verifiably untrue, the myths that LGBT plus people are contagious or corrupting, overly sexual, and too confusing for youth all continue to exist. This is because without inclusive education, entire generations of children are produced who believe these myths. Then they grow up and create the education or non-education for the next generation, and so the cycle continues. That is why it's essential we interrupt this pattern of misinformation. We need to educate ourselves and others about the truths of LGBT issues. We need to identify and push back when we see media like The Daily Mail, CBN, or Irreversible Damage spreading untruths. And whenever we're in Florida, we need to say gay. Whoa, look, we made it back to the beginning of the rainbow. Did anyone notice that the sets were moving through a kind of Roy G. Biv trajectory? Fun stuff. So anyway, back to how all of this affected me psychologically. It sucked. These claims and their scale just felt so big and violating and unstoppable. It was way more scary and overwhelming than any scrutiny I had endured before or in real life. The whole experience kind of reminded me of John Ronson's 2015 book, So You've Been Publicly Shamed, which is all about online shaming and its historical antecedents. In the book, Ronson interviews a Texas judge named Ted Poe. Not a great dude who is infamous for his unusual criminal sentences involving public humiliation. For example, instead of prison time, Poe once made a drunk driver who had killed two people carry the pictures of his victims in his wallet for 10 years. And also for 10 years, he had to regularly stand outside of bars and high schools, holding a placard that read, I killed two people while driving drunk. Poe actually made a lot of folks carry placards stating their crimes. Many of these punishments were reportedly proved too psychologically torturous for people. Some even longed for the chance to swap their unorthodox sentences for more traditional jail time. I think it's safe to say that Judge Ted Poe was intimately familiar with the effects of public humiliation, so it was interesting to learn that according to him, an online shaming seemed much more frightening than any of his real life sentences. He stated, The justice system in the West has a lot of problems. Pfft, you think? But at least there are rules. You have basic rights as the accused. You have your day in court. But you don't have any rights when you're accused on the internet. And the consequences are worse. It's worldwide forever. Then John Ronson went on to write, It felt good to see the balance of power shift so that someone like Ted Poe was afraid of people like us. Just like regular normie people on social media. But Poe wouldn't sentence people to hold a placard for something they hadn't been convicted of. 
When I read that, I had a visceral reaction. Because thanks to the Daily Mail, CBN, and Schreier, I felt like I was being forced to hold placards all around the internet. Placards like this, and this, and this. These placards existed all around the world. They were constantly being shared. They were humiliating, and worst of all, they featured crimes that I did not commit. At the time, though, I didn't feel like I could say anything. I was afraid to stand up for myself. And if you're wondering why, I think that a quote from a member of the Coalition for Human Rights explains it pretty well. It reads, I did not want to spend time denying the child molesting and recruiting allegations made by Save Our Children's advertising. I did not want to make the theme of our campaign, no, we don't molest children. I was afraid if all voters heard every day was gays molest children, followed by no, gays don't molest children, that all voters would remember would be molest children, molest children. That quote was from 1977, but because LGBT phobia is timeless, sadly, the idea still applies today. I didn't want to go on record saying, no, I, Ash Hardell, am not grooming kids. Because while that is verifiably true, I was worried that all people would hear is Ash Hardell and grooming kids. Ugh. It just also seemed so absurd. Like, what a fucking farce. <laughs> the longer I was forced to carry these placards, and the longer I went on not defending myself, the more vulnerable I fell to the ideas my accusers threw my way. It was... It was deeply painful. That said, scale alone was ultimately not enough to convince me that I was recruiting youth or that I was only trans for fame and money. I was certainly starting to internalize these messages, but in my heart, I understood that my gender was authentic and that I did not want or need anybody else to be trans for my sake. I knew that I wasn't trying to turn anyone. For a moment, my defenses wavered, but overall, they stood strong. Until they didn't. Which brings us to when an influential member of the trans community actually made a video on me. At that moment, I panicked. I felt as if my own community was slipping on me and my mental health started to plummet. But that is for next time. Okay, bye! Spoiler alert though, uh, years later, that person did uh, end up reaching out to me, uh, asking for a chance to apologize, and uh, we communicated a little bit, and it was weird, but good. You know, as good as that kind of thing can be, you know, weird but good. Uh, and I guess, like, I just wanted to put that info out there before just, like, dropping it and leaving, so I want you to have the facts before anyone, like, speculates too much, so that did happen. And I guess you'll hear about it, you know, maybe a little bit more next time, possibly. Cool. Hey everyone, so as you know, videos like this take me a long time to create, but one way to make a huge difference and speed that process up, so hopefully we could have two, three, or maybe even four videos a year, is by donating on Patreon. Support from patrons allows me to hire folks to assist with research, writing, editing, and everything else so I'm not such a one-man or one they them show. I appreciate and have so much fun with my community on Patreon and I'd be incredibly stoked if you decided to join. With that said, I'd like to extend a super special thank you to all my patrons, but especially to the top tier supporters, Megan H, Jaden M, Rylan A, Bailey C, Mariah H, JDA, and Jake B. You folks are excellent beyond excellent and I am so grateful for you. All right, take care everyone and see you next time.